and welcome to week eight review for AP Environmental Science. Today's topics are generalist and specialist species, case selected and R selected species, survivorship curves, carrying capacity, and population growth and resource availability. So before we get started talking about populations and how they are regulated, let's talk a little bit about a case study which some of you may be very familiar with. Um, the white-tailed deer population in the United States. So these are the deer that probably when you're uh, riding along the road, you can see them on the edge of forest or they may come into your suburban neighborhood and eat out of your garden or nibble on some of your landscaping. So in 1900, the population was actually reduced to only about 500,000 individuals. And this was because of extreme overhunting. So after a while, uh, the United States decided to pass some laws and, and regulate how these animals were being hunted. And today we have over 25 million. Um, they can cause many different issues. Like I mentioned, they uh, kind of come into suburban areas. They can kind of be a nuisance when it comes to eating people's plants, but they also have dangerous consequences for drivers. Um, more people are killed by accident, uh, automobile, automobile accidents with deer, um, far more than anything like a shark attack or, or something like that. So this is the type of case study or uh, environmental issue about populations that could come up on the AP exam. So what you would need to be able to do is explain how this happened and understand why the consequences are what they are. So speaking of the exam, let's take a minute to kind of talk about the free response section. Um, I know we've been doing some practice problems, but let's kind of look at all of the things that you will be expected to do. So we know that the free response section is 40% of the exam and you get about 70 minutes to complete this. Each are 10 points. There are three questions, one about designing an investigation, one about analyzing an environmental problem, proposing a solution, and then the third one is the same, but you are also doing calculations. So if you were given information like our case study, would you be able to propose a solution? So as we're going through this information about populations, it would be helpful to kind of keep this idea in mind. How is this information helping you to either analyze a particular environmental problem and then point out a uh, valid solution to that problem? So a little bit of review on populations that we talked about in unit one. A population is a group of organisms of the same species in a given area at the same time. So there can be many populations of a species uh, distributed throughout an ecosystem. These populations can vary with the time of year and also the time of day. So seasonal patterns and migration can cause populations to be very dense in one area in the summer, but then almost non-existent in the winter. We can also describe populations by looking at their uh, density and dispersion pattern. So here, like we've mentioned before, we've got uh, three different patterns clumped uniform and random. And if you remember, those are determined by a lot of the life history and um, like species specific characteristics that are in the population. When we look at the change of population numbers, the frequency of that change, the magnitude of that change, we're really talking about population dynamics. And one really important thing that you might have to do on the exam is calculate population density. So this is really easy. Uh, let's do a sample problem here with coyotes in Talladega National Forest. So if we have 500 coyotes in Talladega National Forest and the forest itself covers 1,517 kilometers squared, what would be the density of coyotes in this forest, the population density? So just like you might have done in physics or chemistry, you know, you're going to take the number of individuals and you're going to divide that by the area. And then that gives you the density. So 500 divided by um, 1,517, that is 
coyotes per kilometer squared. Oh, I mixed that up right here. So of course you couldn't really have a third of a coyote, but this just gives you the general density of a partic particular population in one area. But as we saw in our dispersion patterns, these coyotes are probably living in uh, groups or in particular areas of this ecosystem. So what are some of the main ways that we describe population size? So here there are a group of small songbirds, some sparrows or wrens or something like that. And whenever we see other organisms or other uh, individuals of the same species move from one population into this population, we call that immigration. And that's gonna cause this particular population to expand. The other thing that we measure with this are births. So how many new individuals are being added to the population at any given time? So the very simple way that we determine birth rate is we look at the number of births happening within a time period, and that's divided by the total population. We can also do the same thing with uh, factors that decrease population size. So if individuals are leaving the population to move to other areas or to move to a new, another population, that would be immigration. And then we can also look at the death rate within the population. So for these individuals, they're small birds, they're likely to be um, preyed upon, they can have uh, disease, they can die from not having resources, whatever the cause of the death. We look at deaths at any given amount of time, and we divide that by the total population. So if we combine the two factors, births, which increase, and deaths, which decrease, we can then calculate a crude growth rate, or R. So that's births minus deaths divided by the total population. Now, if you needed to, you could also add in immigration, right? So you could put immigration here with the births, and you could put the um, exiting immigration here with the deaths. And you would know at any given time, is this population increasing, decreasing, or staying the same? So speaking of R, which is the, the crude um, growth rate, we also refer to this as the biotic potential of a population or of a species. So biotic potential are all the factors which cause a population to increase in growth. We also call this the intrinsic rate of increase. So you can basically think about it as the maximum rate of growth a population could sustain with unlimited resources or a perfect environment. Now, if we looked at this on a graph, we would see an exponential curve. So this would be an environment where there is plenty of resources, plenty of space, and there aren't really any kind of um, issues with resource, uh, providing resources for the population. So one other thing that you must be able to do when we're looking at population change is to calculate the percent change. So we've done this before with a few other things, but let's take um, a moment to do a little bit of practice. So say we wanted to look at the percent change of this population between the third month and the ninth month. So how much did it increase percentage wise? Well, our formula of course is the final number minus the initial number divided by the initial times 100, and that would give us our percent change. So when we do that for this population, we know that it ended at around here in the ninth month. So that's maybe 200 to 210, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say 210, but it started here at the third month and that's 50. So 210 minus 50 divided by 50 times 100. And if we do that, on our calculator, we get 3.2. We have to multiply that by 100 and we get 320% increase. So 
This is an exponential curve. This would be how a population could potentially grow if it was not limited by resources or other type of factors. So when we look at populations that might have this high intrinsic rate of increase or a really high biotic potential, we're usually looking at species that reproduce very early in life. They also have short generation times, so they mature very quickly, and they also um, have short lifespans. They also are able to reproduce many times, so this would exclude species that maybe only have like one round of reproduction or maybe only a few rounds of reproduction through the lifespan. And they often have many offspring each time they reproduce. So these types of um, species are found in all different uh, kingdoms. You've got mammals that can do this. We often look at small um, like rodents, mice, rats, but also a lot of our insects, uh, crustaceans and things like that. So you can see here, this one female has all of these eggs that are being carried around. Um, so this one individual could have hundreds of offspring at any given time. So I mentioned before that biotic potential is how we describe a population that would be growing with no constraints, you know, perfect environment, lots of resources. But realistically, realistically, we know this is not how actual ecosystems are set up. So when we start to talk about the things that happen that limit population growth, we're really talking about environmental resistance. So when we look at the factors in the ecosystem that constrain growth, but then we also add in the biotic potential of a species, we can determine something very important about the population itself, and that is the carrying capacity. So this is the number of individuals of a species the environment can sustain indefinitely. So. Uh, really quick to mention our letters so far. So when we talked about biotic potential, we used the letter R, the lowercase letter R. And now that we're talking about carrying capacity, we're using this letter K. That's gonna be very important um, in just a moment. So this is different from our exponential graph. If we include carrying capacity, so this sort of um, ceiling limit of the number of individuals that can be in a population, we see that over time, instead of maintaining that exponential rate, it starts to decrease as it comes closer to that carrying capacity. So this is that sigmoid curve, logistic growth. So what are some of these factors that could potentially affect carrying capacity and the maximum size um, that a population can be. So we previously mentioned density independent factors um, as being important to limiting growth. So let's kind of review some of those things. Uh, forest fires, for, exa for example, are density independent. And in ecosystems where forest fires happen regularly, this can be something that would limit the maximum amount of uh, individuals in a population, especially for uh, plant and tree species that are in this area. Something that's really important for all living things would be the amount of precipitation or the water availability. So if there is you know, a limited amount of water and all organisms need it, if that changes, then that can also change the maximum population amount. And then you can look at other things like soil quality, uh, soil macronutrients. Those are gonna limit plant growth, which will then limit everything else. We talked about that, that is uh, bottom up controls on population through the food chain. So some of the, uh, I won't say more important, but some of the ways where populations of organisms are interacting are going to be our density dependent factors. So we talked about this um, as well. Some of the things that happen uh, in a population that would be uh, increasing their effects as density increases would be disease. 
So the spread of disease, the amount of parasites. So you can see here, we've got this deer. Um, it may be experiencing a famine. It could be um, infected with a parasite that's causing it to uh, have reduced uh, survival. We also know that many species are interacting through uh, food web interactions. So predation is one big density dependent factor. As the amount of these predators increase, that is going to then decrease the amount of prey. And then you've got competition, competition either between species or within species. Here, this uh, wolf is marking a territory and it will defend it against other individuals. So the more of these uh, that you have in the population, the greater the pressure and the uh, amount of population growth will slow. So let's get back to this idea of predator-prey interactions because we've talked about these cycles before. So here we've got a predator that is um, in the midst of chasing down its prey. Uh, and this is a food web interaction, top-down uh, regulation. So when we look at the number of organisms that are the prey versus the predator, so here's the rabbits, here are the wolves, we can see that there is an interaction between these two um, populations. So as the amount of prey increase, the food source, that increases the resources for growth of wolves. But this can't continue indefinitely, right? It's not gonna continue to go up here like it would if it was exponential growth because eventually these wolves will eat too many rabbits, their population will crash, and then that will be um, uh, followed by a crash in the predators themselves. And within this cycle, both of the populations are es essentially regulating each other, okay? This is also called negative feedback. So what happens exactly when populations exceed K? So kind of like what we saw in the predator-prey interaction, there is a moment where um, there will be an overshoot. So here's population uh, growth here. And you can see it doesn't just stop at carrying capacity. It's not like it, the population inherently knows when it's too big or when it's too small. It just keeps growing. And then as it outpaces its resources or it overconsumes its resources, then you have a dieback or a crash. So you have this overshoot followed by uh, a plunge in the numbers. So this overshoot and then die back, it lags because of a reproductive time lag. So this is the period needed for birth rates to fall and then death rates to rise. And the reason why is because as the population is getting closer and closer to carrying capacity, there are still organisms that are um, being born. They are just developing. And so you could have more and more being added before there's a um, sort of like tangible reduction in the resources here. And that's why you see this uh, really steep plunge of the population because there's typically many, many more than the uh, environment can actually carry at that particular time. So, so far we've sort of looked at two types of population growth curves. So let's make sure that we are reviewing this because it's often on the test. So an exponential uh, growth curve is gonna start out kind of slowly, and then it proceeds to get faster and faster and faster. And that's gonna form that J-shaped curve. Logistic growth though, that is the um, uh, inclusion of things like environmental resistance or carrying capacity. So it has an exponential phase, but until the population gets that environmental resistant and approaching um, carrying capacity, and then it starts to slow down then the population typically fluctuates around carrying capacity. And so you end up getting that S-shaped curve. So this is our exponential growth and this is our uh, logistic growth. But notice up until about right here, it looks very similar to that J-shape. 
So again, realistically, if you had a population in um, like a, a natural environment, you would not see them maintaining a perfect equilibrium of population size. There's those overshoots and then those crashes and then they kind of overshoot again, they may stay stable. And so really real populations tend to kind of go up and down, up and down around carrying capacity. So like you'll see in the multiple choice section, if you get a question on the exam about estimating carrying capacity, it's usually the average of these overshoots and diebacks. So earlier I mentioned that we need to remember those letters for um, uh, biotic potential, which is R. So this is biotic potential, that's R. And then, you know, carrying capacity, we talked about that. And we usually see that as K. So these types of uh, species, generalist species and specialist species often have population growth patterns that are related more to one of these types of growth than the other. So I had mentioned um, these different types of species earlier in a review, but let's kind of just review what we mean by a generalist species versus a specialist. So general species are, are able to occupy many different niches. They are usually um, able to eat multiple different food sources. They have greater ranges of tolerance for environmental factors, and they tend to also um, be able to reproduce very quickly. So sometimes we think about these as pests, so like flies, cockroaches, or mice, or something like that. Now, a specialist species, this is very different. They occupy a very narrow niche. That might be because they are reliant on only one particular food source. They may be symbiotic with another um, population. So they only have um, like one particular area they can live or they need the involvement of another species in order to continue to survive. So things like this are giant pandas or our, um, like top carnivores and things like that. So one of these types of species is much more prone to um, population issues when you have changes in the environment. So because specialists have these very narrow niches, they have less room to adapt when there is a change. They have very specialized needs. So, you know, pandas only have that one food source. Koalas occupy a very particular type of ecosystem. They are more likely to become extinct because of this. And we as humans have uh, various impacts on their set of resources that can make this more likely to happen. They're easily affected by changing conditions. And so we usually call these K-selected species because they have an advantage when conditions are more constant at carrying capacity. Now contrast this with generalists, you know, they have a broad niche. If they have one habitat that is um, disturbed or gets destroyed, they can easily adapt to another one. They're very, they're less likely to become extinct because of this and they have a high range of tolerance. So in disturbed areas, they actually have an advantage uh, when those conditions change over the specialist. So we also refer to these as R selected. So another issue that our K selected species could um, run into is something called minimum viable population. So we talked a little bit about the uh, kind of extinction vortex or the uh, issue when it comes to having a really small population and you end up having less and less genetic information like in a bottleneck event. So we've talked about that previously. So because case selected species have this very narrow niche, they tend to take longer to reproduce or they may need more specialized environments that are conducive to reproduction. They can easily reach this minimum population size if the environment is disturbed too much. So below this, individuals may have difficulty finding mates 
they um, may end up interbreeding and then therefore produce weaker offspring. And you can have this reduction in genetic diversity, which then makes it even more difficult for that species to adapt to a new environmental condition. So we often see this with our endangered species and other species that we are trying to conserve through um, zoos and other conservation pro uh, projects. So it's really, really difficult to get these organisms to uh, breed fast enough for them to adapt to a changing environment. These are all uh, considered specialists. So another way that we can look at populations and how they are changing are through life tables and um, using cohorts to track their changes. So life tables are these age-specific summaries of the survival pattern of a population. We'll also mention this next week when we talk about human populations, but this can be used for any population. So what you do is you follow a group of individuals that are the same age from birth until death, and you can determine how many of them are dying in each age group, and you construct, construct a life table. So this is an example for building ground squirrel, squirrels at a particular area. So here we've got the age ranges, the cohorts. We can determine how many are alive at the very beginning. We can then, uh, determine their deaths by doing a recapture method, and we can track that throughout the entire lifespan. So we know in general, uh, but you know, the first few years are gonna have the um, more deaths occurring, and then at the very end, 100% are going to end up uh, dying there because they've reached the end of the lifespan. So what this can tell us is something about life expectancy. It can tell us about um, whether these species are, are selected or case selected by looking at the number alive at the start of the year. So for instance, let's kind of track that. So here we've got, you know, let's make a little graph here. So say right here, that's about 400. So let's say that's 200. This is year one. And this is the, the end here. And that could be the middle. So here we've got, you know, a little over 300. And um, we've got 337. And then it decreases to 252. And then now we're getting lower and lower. And it just keeps on uh, decreasing like that. So a lot of them end up dying early and then you've got that nice little curve. So what we call these are survivorship curves. These are the graphical display of the life table, kind of like how we quickly just did. So typically we see three main patterns with survivorship curves. Type one are going to be species that uh, have a long lifespan or they tend to survive for a long amount of time and then most of the deaths that occur in the population are very late. So we would be considered a, a type one species as well as some other like uh, top predators or organisms that are in the upper levels of the food chain. Then you've got type two. This is where there are like an equal number of deaths throughout the lifespan. And so it just slowly decreases until there aren't any left at the end. Type three curve individuals, those are the ones that have many, many, many offspring. Most of them die early, but those who survive tend to do so for the rest of the lifespan. So how does that relate back to our ideas of K-selected and R-selected? So our R-selected species, those are the ones that thrive in an unstable environment. They have a, an advantage when it comes to disturbed environments. They tend to be small organisms. The energy requirements to reproduce for each individual are very low. Therefore, they have many, many offspring. They tend to uh, mature very early. So they are born, um, reach sexual maturity, and then reproduce very quickly. They have uh, short lifespans, 
and they display that type three survivorship curve. So if you've got one individual that has hundreds of offspring at any given time, most of them are not going to live and th then those that make it live for the rest of the lifespan. So this is very different from case selected. Remember those organisms have uh, advantage in a more stable environment. They tend to be larger than our selected species the energy used to make individual is very high because of this. So if you think about the gestation period of a human or, a, or a, an elephant, it takes many, many months, right? They tend to have few offspring and because of that, they have more parental care. So if you only have a few at any given time, it's in your interest um, for, for your genes to pass on to be able to care for those offspring and make sure that they survive. Because of this, they tend to have longer lifespans and they can reproduce um, uh, more than once throughout the lifespan. The, the survivorship curve for these are type one or type two. So let's get into some multiple choice practice. So question one, which curve represents the biotic potential of the species? So we just finished talking about that. Biotic um, potential would be that variable R. Um, so we've got four different curves that we can look at here, A, B, C, or D. So let's take a look at A first. So A is this curve here. Now that looks like exponential growth. That's probably going to be our, our answer. But let's make sure we look at B. B starts off the same way, but then you've got this overshoot and die off, overshoot and die off. That sounds like um, a population at carrying capacity. C, this dotted line, starts off fast and then levels out. That looks like our perfect sigmoid curve. And then D, you've just got this kind of linear straight line. So of these, the curve that represents biotic potential or the most individuals that can be made at any given time is definitely going to be A, that exponential curve. Which curve represents the maximum number of individuals that can be supported by a particular ecosystem on a long-term basis? So just like we looked at for the other question, we've got two curves that give us a clue to what this is. So we've got B, which is probably uh, actual realistic population growth. And then you've got C here, where it's got exponential growth until it starts to level out as it reaches this line right here. So the uh, curve that represents that would be E, that is carrying capacity. Question three. Scientists are closely monitoring wildebeest populations to examine the effect of global climate change on habitat. The maximum population size for a herd of wildebeest based on the amount of habitat is estimated to have been 150,000. One such herd currently has a population size of 75,000 as a result of habitat loss. Which of the following methods should be used to determine the percent change between the maximum population and the current population of the herd. So we have to remember what our percent change formula is. So that is final minus initial over initial times 100. So they give us the numbers that we need. We know that the estimated um, maximum population size was 150. And we know now that it has been reduced to about 75,000. So this was our initial number and this was our final. So when we look at the answer choices here, we know that A cannot be right because it doesn't include the subtraction there um, in the numerator. We know that uh, B can't also be true because we're not gonna be dividing by 100, we're gonna be multiplying. So we really only left with C and D. So are we adding or should we subtract? We should definitely subtract. So the correct answer is D. We would take the 75,000 and subtract it from 150,000, divide it by the initial and then multiply by 100. Question four, based on the graph, what is the approximate carrying capacity of the deer population on Walla Walla Island? <laughs> 
So let's look at the graph first. We can see here that when population numbers are really low, it's probably um, abundant resources. There's not any competition. And so population growth is exponential at first. Then we see this peak and then decline. And then it kind of stays around here. So this was that overshoot period of growth where the population was exceeding carry capacity and it had degraded its own resources. And then it sort of ends up being stabilized around this number. So we drew a line that goes along with that. It'd be around 80. So let's look at our answer choices. We know it's not 10. That was just the uh, starting population. Um, 50, it was still kind of, you know, doing some exponential growth around there. And so 80 is going to definitely be our approximate carrying capacity. Question five. Oysters are saltwater bivalve mollusks that are commonly consumed raw. They reach maturity after a year and can release up to 100 million eggs annually. Many of these eggs will be fertilized, but only a few survive to reach adulthood. Based on this description, the oysters are case strategist with a type one survivorship curve, R strategist with a type three survivorship curve, K strategist with a type three survivorship curve or R strategist with a type two. So looking at our graph, we know that type one, these are the types of organisms that have small amount of offspring. They tend to live long uh, or a long lived and they have high parental care because most of the organisms are surviving, right? Now this is different from a type three. It looks like most of the organisms end up dying early and then they're able to live the rest of the time. So these oysters reach maturity very quickly and they are releasing millions of eggs. So there's no way they could provide parental care for any of those. So we are like looking at an R strategist with a type three curve here. Question six. Coral reefs are known to have a large variety of animals. One example are the crinoid shrimp that form symbiotic relationships with feather stars, another species found in coral reefs. Another species, the lionfish, can live anywhere on a reef where it can find food and can reproduce very quickly, and they can also tolerate brackish water in estuaries. Which of the following statements best describes why it is predicted that the crinoid shrimp will be more affected by global climate change than the lionfish. So let's take kind of a minute to contrast these two species. So one, we know that they are living in a very diverse ecosystem. So coral reefs have a high amount of biodiversity and are likely to be um, uh, somewhat stable. So the shrimp themselves are in this symbiotic relationship with another type of species. So it's unlikely that without the feather stars, they would be able to um, survive. Now the lionfish, it says that it can pretty much live anywhere on the reef where it has food, it can reproduce quickly, but it also is able to be in places that are not 100% marine. They're able to actually live in these sort of like uh, barriers between a freshwater ecosystem and a saltwater. So of these two species, it sounds like our shrimp are more of the, um, gener or, sorry, more of the specialist species in this case, and our lionfish are more of the uh, generalist. Okay, so this is the generalist, and this is the specialist, um, especially considering that symbiotic relationship. So let's look at our answer choices. Crinoid shrimp tend to be advantaged in habitats that remain constant. The coral reef habitat is likely to shift because of global climate change. That sounds correct. Um, as the climate changes, the number of shrimp is likely to increase, leading to more competition for, for space um, from other shrimp. So that probably won't happen because we know climate change is uh, dangerous to corals. Uh, crinoid shrimp are generalists, so global climate change will give them more diverse habitats. Well, we just 
establish that they are indeed specialists. Climate change will lead directly to the die-off of many coral species, resulting in the reduction in habitat for both the shrimp and lionfish. Now that is absolutely true for the shrimp, but remember the lionfish, they have somewhere else that they could potentially populate. So it's more likely that the shrimp will be affected because they are more of a specialist species than the lionfish. And in fact, lionfish are invasive species um, uh, in the United States. So let's look at some, uh, a free response question that is about the African elephant population. So populations of large terrestrial animals such as African elephants and snow leopards are in decline around the world. Many of these large animals are now on the verge of extinction. So we've got a clue here when they tell us that they are large animals, those are possibly our case selected species. So they want us to calculate the percent loss of elephants in Africa from 1970 to 2000 and show all the work. Uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature estimates that the elephant population will decline by 20% between 2015 and 2022. We're gonna use this estimate to calculate how many elephants will be left in Africa in 2022. And then lastly, identify two conservation strategies that could be implemented and explain how they would prevent the extinction of large terrestrial mammals, such as the uh, African elephant and snow leopard. So this is that part of propose a solution that you would see in a free response question. Let's look at A first, calculate percent loss. So far, we've mostly talked about percent change. So we wanna know by what percentage has the population changed, negative or positive? But this is different. They're actually asking us what percent of the elephants from the original population have been lost. So let's look at the table to get the numbers. So in 1970, there were 2 million elephants. So two times 10 to the six and they decreased in 2000 to only 400,000. So that is four times 10 to the five. So in order to calculate the percent loss, we need to know what the difference between this initial population and final population is, and then we need to know what percent of the original that is. So we do that first by uh, uh, subtracting the uh, last amount here, 400,000, from the original amount. So this is subtraction of exponents. So remember, we have to uh, make sure that they have the same exponent. So let's convert 2 times 10 to the 6 to 20 uh, times 10 to the 5 here. And that gives us 16, right? Times 10 to the five. So now we can get that back into uh, scientific notation in the best form. So that's 1.6 times 10 to the six. That is how many of the original population was lost in this time period. So now for the uh, percentage part. So 1.6 times 10 to the six, we wanna know how many of the original population that was. So that was two times 10 to the six. So we know the exponents are gonna cancel out because this is just subtraction. And so uh, we divide 1.6 by two and that gives us 0 0.8. But we also need to know the percent loss. So we're gonna multiply that by 100, and that gives us our answer, 
80%. So 80% of these elephants were lost between 1970 and 2000. So you would have gotten two points here, one for the correct setup and then one point for the correct answer. So again, you, you've got your calculator now on the exam, so you should be able to get the correct answer, but it's so, so important for you to show that setup just in case um, you punch in a number wrong or, or something like that. You can still get that point. So part B was about the uh, predicted decline in the population. So you've got a uh, 20% uh, decline between 2015 and 2020. So we need to calculate how many elephants might be left then at that time period. So we are looking at the 2015 number, which is uh, 600,000. And we know that they will decline by 20%. So again, two points here are earned for the correct setup and uh, for the correct answer. So there's kind of two ways that you could go about doing this. If we know that the population is going to decline by 20%, that really means that there will be, you know, 80% left in 2022. So 80% of whatever was happening in 2015. So we know that there's six times 10 to the five elephants. We can multiply that by 0.8 and that gives us 4.8 times 10 to the five elephants. You also could have done this though by looking at the 20% um, and then just subtracting that from the original. So 0.2 times our number in 2015, that gives you 1.2 times 10 to the five. And then simply you just subtract it from the original number and you get the same result. So the last question here was about identifying two conservation strategies and then explaining how they could prevent the extinction of the large mammals. So a lot of these interventions you will learn about later in the course, especially in unit nine, but I'm gonna go ahead and tell you some things that could help here. We know that elephants and things like snow leopards are poached, so they are over harvested. That's one of the uh, human impacts on the population. So if you want to directly address that issue, you're gonna have to talk about a strategy that is gonna intervene with poaching. So you could have more laws that limit hunting and you need to explain how that's gonna prevent the extinction. Well, it's gonna cause less poaching and therefore greater animal survival. Uh, you could also just enforce animal and habitat protection laws. That's gonna have the same outcome here. And you can also restrict or prohibit the trade of these species. So if you can limit demand, there's no market for it. So people won't want to actually poach. You can also establish more um, habitats that are protected like preserves and parks. So if they're safe, they're able to live and reproduce. You could educate individuals about the value of animals other than their economic value, and that can increase public support. You could also shift the economic incentive over to ecotourism, which means that people won't want to poach. They'll actually just want to create a market for that tourism. You could actually devalue the animal parts by uh, removing either the uh, part of the animal that is wanted. So in this case, horns, or they have actually started to dye the tusk of elephants because that makes the ivory um, not valuable anymore. And then you can talk about some of the things that we do in conservation programs and zoos, like breeding programs, or um, you can move threatened species to a new location. But whatever it is that you're talking about here, you have to make sure that it is targeted towards the extinction of large terrestrial mammals, okay? So this brings us back around to the case study of that of the white-tailed deer population. So remember, we talked about how their population had been greatly reduced by over-harvesting, by hunting, and then we enacted laws that prohibited and regulated that. We also ended up eliminating a lot of their natural predators. So we took away that top-down population control. And so now we've got this population explosion, right? So could you explain how this happened? Absolutely. Can you identify the consequences? 
They can cause automobile accidents. That is dangerous to uh, human survival and health. They are also considered um, kind of like suburban pests where they go into people's yards and they maybe eat their gardens. So the last thing you need to be able to do here, and this is often the time where in our free response question, you may miss that point, is proposing a solution. So for our dear case study, you would not be able to use those same interventions that were in the free response question. This is not an endangered or um, almost extinct animal. Uh, these are actually um, overpopulating their area. So what could you do to solve this? You could actually maybe increase the, the hunting licenses or um, allow more hunting to occur. You could potentially attempt to reintroduce predators into these areas. But that would only really work for our natural problems. The issue of the uh, coming into suburban neighborhoods and eating gardens, that's really going to only be solved by either trying to avoid building in their territory or some type of preventative measure. So building a fence or uh, planting things that deer don't like to eat or reducing overall vegetation around homes as well. But the point is you've got to be very targeted with your proposed solutions on any free response question. All right, that is it for today. Good luck and I'll see you later.